Well, no. All right. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first ever Chef Panel Q&A, How to Create SOS Free Flavor. Usually at this time, we would do a Iron Chef, but because of the number of people, we just didn't feel it was feasible. So we're doing the next best thing. This is where you get to ask us anything you want about how to create flavor without sugar, without oil, without salt, so that when you leave here and are eating the delicious food by everybody up here, you can hopefully make it yourself. A lot of you submitted questions to me in advance, which we'll ask, and then also feel free to ask questions. The first thing that I want to say is it's SOS free. A lot of you guys keep saying, oh, I'm on the SOS diet. Huge difference. <laughs> right. That's what the Americans are on. So you're not eating SOS. You're, I mean, you maybe you are, but we want to call it SOS free because when you articulate it, it, SOS is sugar, oil, salt. So make sure you put the word free in there. And so we'll just have everybody introduce themselves in case you don't know who we are. And it also refers to um, refined SOS. So, you know, because all vegetables and fruits have like their natural sodium, their natural sugar. So we're talking about re um, refined products, something you get out of a bottle, out of a package, you know, white powdery substances, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yep. So why don't you say who you are and then we'll go to the line. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Fisher. I am a... Uh, cooking instructor here at True North every single Thursday, and I've been working here for almost nine years, oh, wow. and eating plant-based for almost 20 years. Is that enough? Yeah, okay. terrific. So I'm <laughs> Chef AJ, and I'm a guest presenter here for the past nine years, usually just during the extravaganza, but every now and then a few times, and I've been uh, following a vegan diet for over 41 years, and an SOS-free diet since August 1st, 2008. 2000 what? In eight. I make the food for the cult here. <laughs> <laughs> Not the cool. <laughs> uh, Katie May of uh, the Culinary Gym .com. My previous company was Plant Street, and I teach. I've been teaching here for seven years, uh, eating plant based for eight, and um, about every other week though, because I recently moved. So I'm hoping to come back and stay connected to all of you um, as much as possible. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take what the questions we have first. We can start one time with Katie and go down, the other time with Kathy and go down. The first question panel is, when did you first learn about SOS-free cooking and eating? Start with me. Uh, eight years ago, I was raw vegan and uh, heard about that reversing disease, but as soon as I watched uh, Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. McDougall on YouTube and saw that you could reverse disease with potatoes and beans, I immediately switched. Um, at the same time, I started living with a doctor who was uh, reversing his MS with the SOS diet, and so I had to SOS cook for free. him. SOS free, of course. Um, <laughs> so that pushed me at 23 into SOS free, otherwise I never would have been that strict, but loved it so much, I moved down. Uh, when that guy called me, you know, that's when I heard about it and I thought it was like the strangest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> 11 years, four-ish months ago. So I became vegan on September 1st, 1977. I was a junk food vegan for the first 26 years and what Dr. McDougall calls a fat vegan for most of that time. But in the summer of 2008, somehow I got a video of Dr. Esselstyn, who previously I had never heard about, Bailey. And um, he talked about how eliminating oil makes you bulletproof against heart disease. And most of my family either had or had died of heart disease. And I thought, well, I'm a chef. How hard could it be to not eat oil? So I'm not going to eat oil. And then I learned about Joel Furman through a friend of mine that had cancer and that was his patient. But he hated the food. And then it, we, now in addition, now we had no salt, no sugar. Now, Dr. Furman wasn't quite as strict as Dr. Goldhammer because he allowed some flour. He didn't mind chocolate a little bit. He even allowed a little bit of miso and low sodium tamari. So it was a little bit more flexible. But I basically said to my friend with cancer, I'm just gonna eat the way you eat for three weeks just to help you know, set my palate so I can make you recipes. And at the end of three weeks, I felt really good. I didn't wanna go back to eating SOS after that. And then it turned out that Goldhammer had been doing it like forever and it was actually a thing and you know. I first learned about SOS free eating when I started working here. I had nearly 20 years ago gone plant-based after reading one of Dr. McDougall's books. Someone suggested that I read because I had a dairy intolerance. And once I read that book, I just 
boop, I pivoted and I went that way and I loved it and I felt so good. And so I was already no oil and I wasn't a big salt person to begin with so that wasn't a big deal for me. Um, and sweets are a big deal for me. But when I started working here almost nine years ago is when I heard about SOS Free and I thought, well, I'm gonna be working here. I might as well start eating this way and creating recipes for here. My class is here every week. So I started doing that and I've been doing it ever since. And like anything, once you get used to it, you're happy. So it's great. <laughs> now, do you eat and cook SOS Free exclusively? Are we starting with, yeah, we'll start you this day. We'll go. Yep. Go. Okay. All right. I do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. Let's see what we can add to that. Uh, definitely no oil, no concentrated refined sweeteners in the house. If I want sweeten sweeteners, I use dates or applesauce or bananas or raisins or something. Um, like I said, s putting salt on my food, I've never done, so I don't really miss that too much. And definitely no oil in the house. So yeah, I eat that way in my real life, and I try to eat that way when I go out and I ask questions and I'm not embarrassed anymore, so you guys might relate to that after you've been doing this a while. You just ask for what you want, and you might get it, you might not, but nowadays, restaurants and chefs are being asked so much about different ways of uh, preparing food, they're pretty open to it. So I try my best when I go out to eat, um, but at home, yeah, really clean. So ostensibly, Kathy, you're the kind of person that's never really been overweight or struggled with weight or food addiction, and you probably could have a little sugar and a little salt, and, mm -hmm. and it probably wouldn't make a huge difference. So why would you then choose to eat in this extreme manner that, that is so difficult? Good question. Because I just feel so good eating this way, I tell you, I just do. I, I feel good. I. Um, yeah, it's just, and you know, in the beginning when I would go out to eat, I'd be like, oh, I'm going out to eat, I can be a little bit bad or whatever. And I'm not like that anymore. I think I've just gotten over that hump so thoroughly that my taste buds want what they're used to eating at home. Um, so when I do go out and something has salt in it, it's fine. You know, I don't throw fit or mm -hmm. send it back. Uh, I definitely don't add salt. If it has oil in it, sometimes I ask for the home fries without any oil, but there's oil in the griddle, you know, so they come with a little oil. So sometimes I'll eat that, but I always feel funky afterwards. Yeah. I'm, you're, you probably never do that, see? Well, yeah. I try not to. My biggest yeah. challenge comes in, maybe you can help me with this. Uh, you haven't done it to me, but um, the, first of all, the answer is do I eat SOS free exclusively? Absolutely, with one caveat, which I'm trying to change. I don't drink a lot of plant milks. I definitely don't drink them, but when I make a soup, if it calls for it, I put, the, I put in the almond milk in the box because I'm allergic to soy and I didn't want the high fat coconut milk. And that does have salt. So technically, my New Year's resolution is to either make my own almond milk or hemp milk without the salt, or now I hear there's a brand that's just almonds and water. Mm -hmm. So that would be the one, I guess, exception where I'm not gold hammer perfect, but yes, I do. And the reason I do it is because as somebody who's a recovering food addict, like they say, one drink, one drunk. Once I have a bite of something with SOS, all I can think about is when I can have more and more. So it's easier for me to stay compliant than to have to keep detoxifying and neuroadapting every time I go off plan. So I do it because for me it's easier. You know, they say, there's a saying, 100%, uh, it's easier to be, a, what's that saying, moderate than, a per, uh, Perfect abstinence, complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. For me, those of you that are vulnerable to the ego trap, don't do what I'm doing. I'm just saying for me, it's easier. And also, like Kathy said, we love our food, and when we get some of those chemicals, then it kind of says, oh, you know, it kind of takes it away. It's sort of like cheating on your husband. You know, it's kind of good for like a couple of minutes, and then you feel real guilty. I mean, not that I cheat on my husband, but, but you understand what I'm saying. So uh, do I cook SOS free exclusively? Yes, again, another caveat is I'm asked to teach hands-on cooking classes in culinary schools. So occasionally, some of my older recipes have a little bit of miso or tamari. I'm technically not cooking it or eating it like at Rancho La Puerta, so, so that, that would be the exception. And every now and then, I'll get a special order, and, and it's still SOS free, but maybe it'll have some cocoa powder. So those are probably my biggest vices. That said, those ingredients are never in the house. So if, if somebody special, like one of the plant-based doctors says, make me, 
peanut butter, uh, a frozen peanut butter chocolate cheesecake, I'd buy just enough for the recipe. So that would be it. So what I wanted to ask you, so this is where it comes in. If I'm in a regular restaurant that I don't know the people, it's not that I want to offend the chef, but if it is not right, I will send it back. But I have a couple of friends in town that are plant-based chefs. Some of them are well known and they do their best to make it the way I can eat it. But I don't want to eat it. And I, how do you not offend a chef? How do you not take your food without offending you? Mm -hmm. Tell me how to do that. And I hope you're not watching because you know who you are. Please, please don't be watching this today. But there's, <laughs> I, there, I, there's right. so about four times. Actually, I'll tell you who it is later. Four, there's four <laughs> times a year that I'm in a situation where I, I'm just, see, I'm not as disagreeable as you think because I eat it either if I'm full or don't want it because the chef made it just for me. And then I, I don't know what to do when it's a chef because it's like a peer and I feel like I'm offending you. Tell me how to turn your food down without offending you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, what to me, what, what's worse? Offending somebody, you know, once in a, a long time or, you know, keeping the connection like fully alive and well, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, my answer to that question is no, I don't cook uh, SOS free exclusively. Uh, I knew that I was going to be a chef from a very young age, uh, and anything food related will still interest me, no matter what it is. Uh, a lot of my <clears throat> inspiration for the food that I do here comes from regular food. Um, not that long ago, close by here, there was this big donut shop that opened up, <clears throat> and the freaking donuts are like $5 a pop. Oh, no. And I thought, there's got to be something interesting to for them to be charging $5 a pop. So I went. And I, you know, there was something that I'm going to do uh, at some point next year that I drew from that. Oh. And that, I do that often. Um, so, you know, I can't do the potato every single day. I just, <laughs> I just can't. Uh, so, you know, but my brain is wired very differently from, you know, from the girls here. So, uh, for me, you know, like my previous boss will every now and again still call me and she's in a tight situation where one of the chefs got sick or, you know, she's just got an emergency and she'll ask me to come down and cook for her seafood restaurant and I'll go down for a day um, and it's sort of a shot of energy uh, once a year maybe though she'll do that. Um, not something I want to do every day for sure uh, because I've been on the other side doing that every day and now that I'm on this side I know what it feels like to eat that little bit of yeah. oil so uh, you know I can handle it for a day day after day I, I, I can't but and you have to taste I have to taste of course yeah uh, mm -hmm. which I'm okay with you That's know the best part. <laughs> to me maintaining a tight relationship a good relationship with a former boss who I consider now a friend is more important to me than saying oh I don't want to offend you for a year you know how do I do that you know, I just when I go you know what you take with you is the relationships you you establish with people uh, you know you don't take money with you you don't take the salt or the sugar or anything but you're also not going oh man you know I, I was really good and all the things I ate you know for me it's I was do you remember all your stuff do I remember all my stuff yeah from from the Classical uh, chefs. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of the skills I don't use, or if I do, they're very seldom. Um, but I do like, I like using them. Yeah. Uh, so like every other year, I'll make what's called a pâté en crude, which is essentially a very high skill, very <clears throat> detail oriented. Uh, sausage inside of a bun kind of a thing uh, but it's like this very old school very refined kind of a thing you know and I do it once every other year uh, for Thanksgiving just to remember just to remember just to feel that you know I still know <clears throat> what I I haven't forgotten what I know kind of a thing so I make so, so, I make one vegetarian don't have to use sausage and so it looks gorgeous, and everybody, ah, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? Did you spell that? Or?
An on crew? <clears throat> it's at E N C O C R U T. C R U T. How do you know that? I it's French. French. Je parle français. <laughs> if they had one at Millennium, that would be good. Mm -hmm. So, um, so can, can I do you eat and cook? Oh, I was going to. Oh, I yes, was just repeating just the question. <laughs> do you eat and cook SOS free exclusively? I I think I'm a mixture of you two. I'm a total food addict tendency. Uh, at 18, I was eating 90% of my calories from ice cream, mm -hmm. and so I kind of wired my brain to really want the richness. 90? Did you say 90? 90%. Percent. I was subclinically anorexic. I would like eat very lim limited amounts of any other food just so I could eat that ice cream. But I was running seven days a week and never got over 125 because I was, you know, so critical of myself. And anyways, um, my my home, ever since I cooked with that chef, has been SOS free, 100%, because I wouldn't do it any other way. You know, I wouldn't be able to have salt in the house and not add it to my food. Um, so I keep my house very clean, although I'm not cacao free. <laughs> um, but eating outside of the home is something I've always done, uh, allowed myself to have, and sometimes on my journey I've been stricter than other times. But one mistake, I kind of uh, was talking about this in my last cooking demo, uh, not a mistake because it was just part of my journey, but one piece that made it really hard, like Chef AJ is super extreme and clean, it makes it easier. And I made it harder on myself by allowing myself to have mochas which is chocolate lattes, and that has sugar in it. But it wasn't as much of the biological um, drive. Of course, the bacteria in my system was one thing and the pleasure trap. But for me, it's more about, um, I switched to matchas recently, and now I make homemade matcha, but it's still the caffeine. It makes me a different, um, it brings out a different character of myself. <laughs> and that part... You don't want to see her on, on a withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> but that part is something um, I was talking about in my class because I find that really, uh, really crucial to deal with the emotional uh, effect that food has on us and how to develop ourselves so we can give that up. So this year is going to be the year that I really uh, work on my... You know, I, I love myself so much already, but working on myself even more so that I can be just okay without having the caffeine and the sugar that comes with it usually. Um, but I'm also, like Chef Bravo, I love the inspiration I get from other food. And I love ethnic cuisines and flavors, so I go out and I would eat, Chef a Bravo and I did this sometimes together, eating some richer food that we wouldn't have here, but it's fun to have that conversation about what it's like. It's called and enablers. And it is, <laughs> in a way. But um, I don't feel good after doing that, and so, I, you know, in some way I really like it, and in other times I really regret it, you know, and I have pain, and so it's been my own journey of learning that and, you know, having that experience and then finding what really works for me. And I'm a chef, and I want to have a culinary school, and I want to be teaching all these other things, but like Chef AJ, this, the further I go, the cleaner I want my diet to be. I don't want to be having any grain at all, no flour or grain, and that's really hard to be a chef who doesn't work with grain. So I'm like, a chef that can't work with legume. Tell me yeah. about that. Like, but I want to learn how to work with other people to continue teaching th vicariously through them. Um, so we're each on a, huh? our own journey. Okay. We'll start with this. Yes. <coughs> I was going to ask so you have pain when you do that. Are you talking about physical and emotional pain both together? Yeah, a lot of physical digestion from the grain. I have an autoimmune condition. Okay. Um, but emotional, the highs and lows, you know, what that means for your identity um, on top of like the blood glucose issues and uh, which I had the opposite effect of a diabetes uh, person. I had way low blood sugar all the time, even after drinking a lot of sugar, I just got this tested. And um, you know, my after get, drinking a whole thing of sugar, my blood sugar was still 63. And a, an hour later it was 65. An hour late after that, it dropped to like 40. And so that's when I got really depressed and was like in tears, uncontrolled, can't stop. Um, so that's something that is just unique to my journey that I'm dealing with. Um, so each of us is so different on this path. It's not gonna look one way or another, but knowing yourself and what's gonna help you sustain it long term is really important. Thank you. So Kathy and everyone, we'll go down the line. Which of the two S's, or is it the O, that's the easiest or hardest to replace? 
I think the salt is the hardest to replace. Sugar, very easy. When you have the final result of your dessert or whatever, and you've used dates maybe for your pumpkin pie, you can't really tell the difference or your muffins. Um, let's see, oil, it takes a little adjustment, but once you get over the hump, uh, you get more used to not having it, I think, than not having salt. So I would say salt is the trickier one, and it's the one I hear about most often from people wherever I am, because wherever I go to an event or whatever, I bring the food the way I make it, and sometimes people will say, even in this class, oh, it needs salt. Um, so I, but I never hear, oh, it needs oil, or oh, it needs eggs, or oh, it <laughs> needs um, sugar. white sugar, you know? So I'd say probably salt. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think sugar is really the easiest. I was a regular restaurant pastry chef for five years as a vegan who didn't use sugar, and they didn't even know because it, to uh, in LA the way it worked to get a job is you audition by just bringing your stuff, and they say I like this, I don't like this. I didn't even tell them that I didn't use oil or salt or sugar, and I wrote a, a dessert cookbook based on this called A Date with Dessert. So regular people ate my dessert at a regular restaurant, including celebrities. So I think sugar is absolutely the easiest. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody can do it right away because they they have certain favorite things that they want and they don't know how to do it, but it's absolutely doable, possible. It, it's probably still going to have flour or other things <laughs> like cocoa, but it's absolutely 100% very easy in my opinion to be sugar free and just use the fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the whole fruit. I agree with Kathy, salt is the hardest, that's an ongoing challenge. I went to uh, Savory yesterday, they have some new blends that are very, very good that people will like. Um, I think sometimes with salt, one of the best things you can do is give yourself heat. Because like those vinegars, like that blazing habanero, if you put it on rice and vegetables, I don't think you're gonna miss the salt because you're gonna be very satisfied with the flavor from the heat. That's why I think Mexican food is probably the easiest to, to make SOS free because you can use so many things like, you know, a lot of cilantro and jalapeno and chipotle. And I mean, look, Ramses and Mauricio's food is just good food. It just happens to be SOS free. You could serve it to anyone. So I do think salt's the hardest. I, you know, if anybody that didn't get a sample of the Benson's, I'm happy to give it to you. Little things like this help. The thing about the oil, oil is actually easy, especially if you're willing to use whole food fat like nuts, tahini, avocado. But what's hard about the oil what for people isn't the taste, because the taste is fine, but it's the, it's the neuroadaptation of getting less stimulation from dopamine. And if you were at my first lecture where I talked about how the more concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released, nothing is more calorically concentrated than oil at 4,000 calories a pound. And so to neuroadapt from a high fat diet to a lower one, there is some discomfort in a person that could go for 90 to 120 days, but it's not a culinary discomfort. So oil is super easy, so. Salt, definitely the hardest. Uh, just, just the way it goes. Um, but I talk about this during my uh, private classes. So um, Ken has taken them, and um, I forget the lady's name. Marjorie. Marjorie. Um, so we do this thing where, you know, we're cooking something. Um, so we'll have, I'll start them out with like, um, roasted squash like a butternut squash kind of thing and then we pair that with some sort of like curry or like garam masala sort of you know very pungent spices kind of thing uh, and then we're tasting the dish as we go along and every now and then somebody will say you know well it just needs salt okay yeah. so if you ever feel that way here's what is actually happening you're not activating enough taste buds in your tongue. So when the message goes to the brain, the brain goes, eh, you know, it's, there's something there, but I'm not really entertained. So then we have the sweet and the butternut squash and the spices all in there, so that's the spiciness. But then we'll add some uh, like rice vinegar to, to the dish. And suddenly, you know, you, what's happening is you activate a third taste bud. The message goes to the brain, and the brain goes, oh, okay, now this, this is something, because now there's more going on. So if ever you think, oh, well, this, this could use some salt, all it is is your brain saying, I don't have enough taste buds activated at the same time, so this is kind of boring. So either, you know, do something else with it kind of a thing. I don't know if that helps. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, of course, the same. Salt is the hardest. Um, and my uh, little trick I like to teach people is along the same lines of make the dish more flavorful, right? You have to activate the taste buds. Salt is just what you think of because it's the easiest. It's the easy way out for chefs to flavor their food. Lazy. Lazy and easy for the sugar, oil, and salt, but mainly salt. Another easy thing on the that's just starting to trend now is MSG. We were using it in Asian restaurants before, but different um, sources of umami, I shouldn't say MSG, but um, MSG is one way to get umami in a very processed way. But umami is a very healthy and very necessary taste in addition to the sweet, salty, and sour. So if you know to to bring in the umami from the beginning along with those other flavors, you can make your dish more flavorful from the beginning um, by doing certain things like mushrooms, sauteed, um, a lot of fermented foods, um, aged things, things that are more ripened, like sun ripened tomatoes rather than the unripe tomatoes. Uh, but at the end, if you had little boosters, umami boosters, you could use it in the same way you would salt or the sour from the vinegar and lime you could add a little bit of nutritional yeast, which we don't want to do a lot of here because it's not a whole plant food, but um, that uh, Benson's Table Tasty has umami in it. Um, so see what umami is. Umami is it, so it's a taste. Mm -hmm. Let me spell it for you in case you're um, wondering. U-M-A-M-I, and something has umami just like it would have sweet, salty, sour, bitter. It's the fifth taste, mm -hmm. okay? So when we're wanting really amazing flavor, the more taste you can bring in, the more variety. So all five would be best to have all five tasted. And doc, er, Dr. Chef Bravo does an amazing job with all the food here because he, he reduces things so much. So he's concentrating all those flavors um, and a lot of the mushrooms and the tomatoes that all has umami. So that's just one taste that a lot of people forget about, um, but that's one way you can boost the flavor of your food easily. If you if you have trouble with the umami thing, just think like earthy flavors. Yeah, like savory deliciousness. Mushrooms, uh, the um, like the red rice, you know, so the sort of that clay sort of very earth taste to to it. There's uh, a cooking different techniques to build the umami in foods. If you ferment it, you dehydrate it, you cook it like a long cooking, like stewing or roasting, or if um, said fermenting just sun ripening on the tree is all going to increase the umami so you can do that so rather than just having a salad have a salad with a little um, sauteed mushrooms on top you know or the sun-dried tomatoes to bring in a little more of that umami so it's not so plain did you say benson's has uh, umami yeah that? just the dehydrated vegetables there oh, just the are going to be because all all food has this umami it's not something it's not like msg we need to be scared of it's like we all fruit has sugar. It's the difference between whole natural sugar and the refined sweetener. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Katie Mae, what is your general thought process when converting a recipe to the instant pot? You know, I am just getting into the instant pot more over the last couple of years. So, this is something I want to dive into more methodically. Um, but in general, I you have a you have a soup recipe. I would add it all at the beginning, except for the things that you don't need. Um, and I'm thinking of like a soups or stews rather than just plain vegetables or something. But you add what you can at the beginning, um, and then items that you don't want to cook as long, you stir in at the end, like kale or spinach. Even kale, even though it's hardier than spinach, you could just stir it, chop it really small, and stir it in at the end, um, and it would cook enough because the soup is hot enough. Or bell pepper, corn items that you don't want to overcook, add at the end. Um, of course, you could get more nuanced and add some things in the middle and then turn it on again. Uh, but that's kind of my first step. And you also think about the moisture content in the dish, because you're not going to lose any water to the evaporation. So you may not need to add as much liquid for soups and things like that. I do not use Instapots. Uh, they don't turn me on at all. Uh, <laughs> So I'm here 10, 12 hours a day. I got time to cook everything from scratch, so uh, that's not a thing I, I do. Um, but all the ladies here use them. They're, they're good at it. Um, 
To me, the worst thing about it is what she mentioned, that you don't lose moisture. Therefore, all the water, which tastes like nothing, which you know you can't get rid of, which is the big thing that I do here. Um, so that kind of goes against you know what I do here. So, uh, and you know when you got 60, 70 people, you know, and the things are you know eight quarts, mm -hmm. that, that that doesn't help. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not knocking it down if it you know. <clears throat> what I tell people is like they'll ask about you know using microwaves or instapods or. Um, What's that other one? Air the fryer. crock pots or air anything, fryer. air fryer. <clears throat> if using something like that helps you maintain the diet and you stay away from all the other, you know, the bad stuff, then go ahead, use it. Yeah. Cool. So I, I don't like to reinvent the wheel and there are five vegan instant pot cookbooks already out there. Two of them are sold at Costco. One is Kathy Hester's book and Trying to think what the, and Jill Nussenau's book. Jill is a local, uh, she teaches at the college here and also teaches at McDougal. And there is one by uh, Lorna Sass. It's actually the only vegan cookbook that ever won the prestigious James Beard Award. It's called yeah. Great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure. And Jill McKeever has an Instant Pot cookbook and Hive Carp Hannah. I have four of those five books. And so if I'm gonna convert a recipe, I will look through those books and just see maybe there's something similar. If it's a split pea soup or if it's a gumbo, why not just look and see what they did as far as time and then convert it that way. The other thing is, is Kathy Hester, who does speak at our annual, not does speak, but she's been coming to our annual Vegas conference. She has a wonderful free Facebook group uh, based on uh, the Instant Pot, and, and she's wonderful about answering questions specifically about the Instant Pot. I believe Jill Nussenau also has a free Facebook group on the Instant Pot. And, and like Katie said, you, you time it to the longest cooking ingredient, and that's what you do. But you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna throw in beans, and I'm gonna throw in rice, and I'm gonna hope it works. No, um, if the beans are already cooked, maybe. But, it, and also, what's the worst that can happen? Think about it. There's only two things that could possibly happen bad. If you're cooking, say, zucchini, you don't cook it for 20 minutes, zero minutes. You could get it too mushy. But in the case of you didn't cook it long enough, oh well, you just put the top back down, you can always add time. So it's, it's, it is a learning curve, but I find it really useful to get meals on the table fast. Could you reiterate Lorna Sass? Lorna Sass was the first, to my knowledge, vegan cookbook called Great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure. And I love how you just open it and the, the chart is on is right there. You don't have to like, where's the chart? It's right there. And she has some very high-end recipes. What's nice about Kathy Hester's book is that she gives always SOS-free options. So even though she personally isn't, I really admire what she does was just to give the option for us. So the, the, you named five. Right? Um, a great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure. Oh, J.L. Fields also has an in, a pressure cooking book. I'm sorry if I forgot you, J.L. I don't always know the names of their book. I think it's called Vegan Pressure Cooking uh, for, for J.L. Fields, Vegan Under Pressure for um, it's okay. Jill Nussenau, the I Ultimate Instant Pot Cookbook from Kathy Hester, Great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure, Lorna Sass. I don't know High Carb Hannah's iPod book's name, and I don't, and Jill McKeever's is like OMG something. I'm sorry, I don't have all the names memorized. And which one won the award? Lorna Sass is uh, won for Great Vegetarian Cooking Under Pressure. It's a, it's a very okay. good book. Okay, what can I add? When I'm taking one of my recipes and I'm instapotizing it, like I your will, stew. like my beefless stew, I will cut the more denser things bigger and the less denser things smaller. So they have a better chance of cooking kind of in the same way, you know what I mean? So potatoes I will cut bigger so they won't get overly mushy. The onions I will cut uh, smaller. Is that right, or do I have that backwards? I think you said yeah. that backwards. backwards. Yeah. So the potatoes should be cut a little smaller and the onions a little bit bigger. Uh, <laughs> so that helps a little bit, you know, that's not a cure-all for all Instant Pot things. Uh, but certain things like beans and rice is one of the things I like to make in my Instant Pot. And I will time it to the rice, no, to the beans, because they're dry. And the rice is just fine. It takes less time if you were to cook it by itself, but I don't eat it and go, ugh, it's too mushy. It works out really great, and I put in, you know, a can of diced tomatoes, some um, uh, chili powder, mix it up. It's great. That's great to have in your fridge for the whole, you know, three or four days. 
and I'm also not a big instant pot user. I still kind of dabble. I'm a beginner. I recently just made whole potatoes and sweet potatoes in the instant pot, and I was like, yay, that was so great. So I'm, I still have a lot to learn, but I love it, and I don't know if anyone said what the instant pot was up here. No. But it's a, I always have someone in the class like, what's that? Most people know, but it's a countertop electric pressure cooker that makes it, it doesn't always take less time to like make beans from scratch, but it makes it a lot easier because you don't have to think about it. You just put it in, you just push the button, and then when it's done cooking, it stays warm. And if you're in the other room and you forget about it, it's great. You don't burn your beans or your food. So. I find if I'm making a soup and it somehow didn't come out right, I just puree it. There's something magical with the puree stuff. Because now it's something else. And, yeah. and and then you can use it as the base for something else. So Or mm -hmm. give it to your pet. And, but but it, it, most things do come out pretty good. So we'll start with you, Kathy, this time. How do you convert a regular recipe to an SOS free recipe? Mm, I have a lot of experience. I guess we all have a lot of experience with well, let's see, I will get a, an idea for a recipe that I don't already have, like lasagna or something, and I'll just go online and I'll peruse other recipes, vegan, non-vegan, the cookbook's on my shelf, and I will look at all the common ingredients um, that are health-promoting, I'll keep those in. All the things that aren't health-promoting, including SOS, I will leave out. And so that's kind of the broad approach. And then I go to the kitchen, I cobble it together, and then I go to the kitchen and I try it. And I usually do that four, three or four times before I land on the version that I really like. But how do you convert? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's so many different things you can do depending on what you're doing. You know, if you're doing a salad dressing and you don't want to use oil uh, versus if you're stir frying and you don't want to use oil. So I could kind of go on and on all you about talk that. talk a little bit, we've got some time. Oh. This is an important mm -hmm. question, because this is the okay. main question yeah. I think of the day. Yeah, so it's, it's really not that tricky. For example, if you're sauteing and you want to leave the oil out, you just use water, you use vegetable stock instead, and uh, you just kind of stand there and keep an eye on it and so it doesn't burn. So that, that's super easy. If you're wanting oil in a baked good and you're wanting that moistness, you can use um, applesauce, you can use bananas. And yeah, it's not exactly the same, but when you're eating the final product, you're just so happy that mm -hmm. you can be eating a blueberry muffin that doesn't have oil in it. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what else do I, roasting? I don't roast that much, but you just stick it in there. You don't need oil coating it. Uh, we don't really need oil for all, so many things. We've just gotten used to using it. So I, I in my cookbook, I, I think I do. I have a whole uh, section on how to cook without oil and I break it down into salad dressings and stir frying on the stove top and baked goods and stuff like that. So there's always a way, that's one of my little taglines. There's always a way to get around it, and the more you do it, the easier it gets, and it doesn't seem so weird. So. Like Ramses said yesterday in his cooking demo, how he doesn't really like recipes. That it, I'm the same way, believe it or not. I didn't just, say I didn't like them. Oh. <laughs> I said I, they're a guideline. They're yeah. not. Mm -hmm. I mean, like that you don't wrong. that you don't like to necessarily follow them. Like, you just eat it. like you know, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was so traumatized by the demo yesterday and the way I was being treated that I just don't remember <laughs> so many things you said. But anyway, what I, what I, I'm the same way in that a lot of people, I probably get at least one email a day with somebody saying, this is my grandmother's um, um, rugala, or this is my aunt's, you know, moussaka, make it SOS free. And for me, it's easier if you just tell me you want rugala or moussaka, because once I see that recipe, it's like, I've, I'm almost like a deer in the headlights. So. It's easier for me, this is just me, maybe not you guys, it's easier for me to create a recipe from scratch mm -hmm. than to try to retool a recipe that was not SOS free. Mm -hmm. Now, if the all, if the, it depends if the oil, sugar, and salt, the quantities it's in, and how many. So if a recipe, if the only thing that had different was oil, and it wasn't fried, well then it's real easy. We use, like Kathy said, if the only thing in there that's not SOS free was the quarter cup of oil to saute the vegetables, 
easy peasy. You take it out and you water saute it. But if it's in there in a salad dressing because it needs to emulsify, you can't just take it out. You gotta put something else in, whether it's broth or liquid or tofu or fat. See, so it depends why the SOS was in there. Now, mm. as hard as it is to neuroadapt to a lower salt diet, in some ways, just taking the salt out is the easiest because you take it out, you make the recipe, and you put the salt shaker on the table for the people that can have salt, and then for you, you put on Benson's or vinegar or things like that. One of the things I love about vinegar, and even if you don't buy the high-end vinegars, we're talking just apple cider vinegar or rice vinegar, is that our taste buds for salt sit next to our taste buds for sour. So, you know, if you, if you put a little lime juice or lemon juice on your greens, you're putting sour and you think you maybe had something salty. And sugar, of course, I've always believed is the easiest. It's, I mean, I mean, even, you know, you could use an equal amount of date sugar. Date sugar is basically dates that have been dehydrated and ground. So to me, sugar is, is I mean, unless you were making cotton candy or something, you know, but sugar is, is very, very easy for me. So um, that's what I do. I look at the quantity of the S, the O, the S, if it has just one, it's super easy. If it has two, a little harder. If it all three, harder. But for me, it's just easier to create what you want, put my thinking cap on, than try to look at the recipe and then like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this because I don't know what that person had in mind. And the truth is, is the way I can, like you were saying how like you like to taste things like that donut. It's very hard for me to create something that I've never tasted. So for example, the pecan pie that you guys are gonna have New Year's Eve, a few years ago, Lindsay said, can you make a pecan pie for my husband, Scott, for Thanksgiving? And I'm like, I know what pecan pie tastes like, so yes. So it's hard for me to create something I've never tasted, and since I haven't had the version that you're trying to get me to recreate, it's a little hard for me. But um, For me, it's really about the uh, evaporation. It, that's mm -hmm. the, if you wanted to start with the simplest thing is just evaporate water out of it in any which way you can. Um, and again, that's why I don't like Insta Buds. So either it's a dry saute, which I showed you guys how to do yesterday. Uh, and I you know, was talking about how when the steam has escaped in the pot, you know, you're getting rid of the water, and which water doesn't taste like anything. It dilutes flavor, so you want to get rid of that. Uh, or even in the oven when you're roasting something you're still evaporating water out of there so the mushrooms that you guys are making us go 30 pounds a day mm -hmm. here in the salad bar okay those go in the oven and we evaporate the moisture out of them and that's why they you, you guys like them so much because we are essentially just concentrating the flavors in the mushrooms and you go wow these are, mushrooms are so good all we doing is just evaporating the water out of it that's the How? most basic, you know, the most basic way of putting it. How long and what temperature do you put them on? 350, 15, 20 ish minutes, depending on how much stuff we have in the oven. Uh, you know, yeah, so, uh, and from there, you know, it gets a little bit trickier. Like AJ said, you know, you it's hard for, for me even to somebody gives me a recipe and they go, here, make this as well as free. You know, you kind of have to look and see what the oil is doing necessarily because oil and in, in from one recipe to the other it does different things uh, you know sometimes it's there to make something crispier sometimes there to give the recipe moisture um, so you know you kind of have to go recipe by recipe you know thing by thing to kind of figure out so it's, it's a little bit harder to, to do that than to just come up with with your own kind of version of it but just to make it simpler for you guys, just start evaporating water out of everything <laughs> at all costs in any which way you can. I want to ask you a follow-up question to what you're talking about because you really, of all of us, came from the real traditional background. Do you find, though, that when people are willing to give up oil, even if they love salt, they tend to need less of it? Yes. Uh, so there's a very direct correlation between oil and salt. What happens is if you're eating something that's oily and you put that, you know, spoonful of whatever that is in your mouth, a dressing, a vegetable dish, whatever that case may be, the oil acts like a, like a blanket over your taste buds, okay? So when you eat something oily, then the flavor of whatever rest of the ingredients are in there, they can't get to your taste buds. So once you remove the oil and that blanket covering your taste bud is removed, then it's much easier for the flavors to go from your taste buds to your brain. So, uh, like I said, somebody was asking me like, uh, 
uh, or I mentioned that somebody had asked me, you know, what's the easiest thing to start with, you know, the, the first thing to give up in order to get to the ideal goal. And I said, you know, get rid of the dairy first. Dairy meaning, you know, get rid of the oil, you know, a good chunk of the oil in your diet. The less oil you eat, the more you actually taste your food, and then the less salt you need. Great, thanks. Um, I agree with everything they said, and I love the, the evaporation. I really don't work on evaporating the water out of my food as much, but I often try to start with less water. I use less water when I mash potatoes because you have to pour out half that water, so why start with a full thing of water? I don't use water when I saute, even though a lot of people do like that. I just start with a dry saute, and then you add moisture as you need it. Um, and when you add moisture, ideally use the moisture that's already in the recipe or in your dish um, so you're not adding extra water. Uh, but when we're talking about taking out the sugar, oil, and salt. If you've had the dish before or you're trying it, mm -hmm. see how you can develop the flavor elsewhere. It doesn't have to be like a sugar replacement for the sugar or salt replacement. It could be adding, you know, like uh, AJ said, the vinegar instead of the salt. Um, but the same thing like with the umami, it could be just boosting the flavor somewhere else in the dish because it just needs to be really amazing for you to eat it. It doesn't have to be necessarily the same profile flavor profile it was um, the other thing is if you're replacing it like the sweetener if you're going to replace the maple syrup or the white sugar with a sweetener you can't just automatically use uh, bananas you know bananas have a very distinct flavor um, and you don't want to just use peach you love peaches but you don't want to use peaches any time of the year because they're not always ripe and they're not going to be the best flavor any time of the year so you want to think about the seasonal options, what's best in the stores, what you can find, um, but also what fits with all the other flavors. You know, if you're trying to, if you're not having the salt and you want to add more herbs, what herb is going to pair really well with the Mexican dish? You know, it's going to be mostly cilantro, but if you're doing um, like a wintertime dish and you want to add an herb, uh, more of the winter herbs would be like rosemary or mint. Um, so thinking about how the whole dish comes together makes a big difference in the overall um, experience and enjoyment. Um, and I want to make a recommendation. Um, the Vegetarian Flavor Bible by uh, Karen Page is one of my favorite resources. I have three copies because I, I just use it all the time. Um, the Vegetarian Flavor Bible, she has a non-vegetarian one, so make sure it's a vegetarian one. And that still has cheese in it, so you want to avoid that. But you could look up you know, if you're trying to make a Mexican dish, or that's so easy, but if you're trying to do, not easy, but, um, you know, a Mediterranean dish and you're taking out the olive oil and you're taking out the salt, you could look up Mediterranean cuisine in the flavor Bible and it would give you all the Mediterranean flavors, all the different foods that would fit well with that cuisine. Or if you know you're using sweet potatoes and you're not trying to use the oil and salt, how do you make really great flavor with sweet potato? Look up that one ingredient and it will tell you every food that goes well with it. Who's the author? Uh, Karen Page. Um, so she actually was a classically trained chef and was not vegan or anything, but as she was making this version of her Bible, um, she went vegan because it tasted better. Um, so all these people say environment, health, or their um, the ethics for going vegan, she did it for a period of time. I'm not sure if she still is, but it was because it tasted better. Um, so once you know how to cook this way and actually use those ingredients, these plant foods, there's so much we can do with it. Right. Do you have any other tips, either regular tips or cooking tips, for getting maximum flavor without using sugar, oil, or salt? Uh, I think I kind of talked about all of them. My, my just secret is like that umami. I just love it. Um, it's so like, well, you were talking about nutritional yeast being umami. But Dr. Goldhammer really doesn't allow it here, especially for people with any kind of digestion things. So how would you make it like a cheese sauce without the nutritional yeast? Um, oh, you could make cheese sauce. Sweet potatoes are great for cheese sauce. And we have umami. When I say umami is just nutritional yeast, is like salt. It's just super easy to just throw it on there, right? But you have umami in all plant foods. Umami is not just, it's like sugar comes from sucrose and glucose. Those are what stimulate the sweetness flavor. Umami flavor is stimulated by glutamate. 
glutamate is a protein. It's a protein. It's not just a protein, but it's the most prevalent protein in our bodies. We need it to survive. And that's why, from an evolutionary standpoint, we've developed this flavor for umami. And so it's in all plant foods, but it comes in different forms. So you get it from glutamate, glutamine, glutamate, glutamic acid. And depending on the form, that's when you taste it. So I think it's just like sugar. We don't, you know, we don't need a ton of sugar, but when we get more of it, we're super stimulated by it, right? It's just because our bodies are designed to seek it out. So same with umami. That's why I think with, you get so much of it in aged cheese and meat um, and a lot of fish. And so the omnivore diet or a carnivore diet is so high in it. But if you're, you're transitioning to a plant-based diet, I think it's crucial to learn how to develop that flavor because that's what's going to keep us coming back to it. You're going to get it in all the plants, but if you can learn how to concentrate it more, it's going to make your dishes even more flavorful. So cooking things, like imagine sweet potatoes steamed. How amazing are they? Delicious, right? But now imagine them roasted. Even better flavor. That roasting, it brings out more sweetness, but it also brings out more umami. And so just doing little things like that is gonna make a difference. Um, and I just, this is kind of a, you know, a plug for my, my website email address, but it, it's a really helpful free gift all about cooking without the sugar, oil, and salt. Um, if you go to the culinarygym.com forward slash free dash gift, I have a whole cook, it's a little mini ebook, but there's a dozen options for you not using sugar a dozen options for not using oil and salt. And for the oil, I'd really break it down to the fat-free options and the fatty options, because sometimes you want one or the other. Um, they're not equal in interchanging those, so. Do you have any other tips or tricks that can come out the first time? Yeah. You can think about it. Yeah, I mean, really, evaporation. So she's talking about, well, getting more of a mommy out of a roasted uh, sweet potato. When you evaporate the water out of that sweet potato, you're going to get more umami, you're going to get more sugar, you're going to get more of everything, just because you're reducing the volume. But Chef Ramses, you spoke yesterday about cooking the spices before starting to cook oh, to right. make more flavor. So that might be one that, That's thing. another one. Uh, toasting your spices uh, every time. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you use spices, whether it's a curry, whether it's a uh, mole, whether it's a, you know, uh, one of those... Um, savory spice blends the cajun or the whatever they have a, a lot of different um, salt free things so always toast your spices you're going to get more out of them um, and always make sure you like the spices i mean i know that sounds crazy but you know you have to understand that spice blends are just that and it, savory well, not necessarily uh, I've had spices blends that you really like them and then you start putting them on different foods and you go, hmm. No good? Yeah, and then the other way, you're like, I didn't really like this that much, but if I put it on this particular item. What I meant though is, is they, they're different. So for example, when we were in Texas at the Marshall, Texas thing, Melody was the demo coordinator and she bought apple pie spice for my recipe, apple pie rice pudding, which I'm making on the second, it's very popular. I made it and no one would eat it. It tasted terrible. Well, that particular spice blend as the second ingredient after cinnamon had fenugreek, which I have no idea what it is, but it didn't belong in that thing. So what I'm trying to say is, if you one of the nice things about a place like Savory is you can taste it before you buy it, because you may not like it. And if you don't like it like this, you're, it's not gonna magically become delicious because you put it on the food. So what I'm saying is make sure you like the blend that you're getting, if, because, that's, because curry powder, could be 20 different ways, depending on the store or the thing. So, you know, people say, well, what should I buy? What, in, what, what pressure cooker, what air fryer, what spice, what vinegar? Buy the best that you can afford. You know, don't go to the 99 cent store for your spices, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you, so and go to a place that's higher in. I would much rather have a couple of tablespoons of a good quality balsamic than, you know, a, a, a you know, 99 cent store brand that's cheap. So buy the best that you can afford. And I completely agree what they said about the roasting. I don't know why, but the, the potatoes that we had for lunch yesterday, the Hannah yams, the, the ones that were white, the first ones that came out, I mean, they're delicious. If they were just steamed, they would still be good, but they wouldn't be like no, they were good. yesterday. And if they were microwaved, which in a pinch when we travel we have to do, they would be okay, but they wouldn't be as good. So again, roasting is really the secret for 
vegetables of every kind, especially if you don't like them, because it brings out the natural sugars, the caramelization, and it just makes even Brussels sprouts taste delicious. Okay, question? So could, could you all take a crack at this one? Uh, is umami a separate and good taste sensation, or is it just an enhancement of the other so to repeat the question for the home audience, is the umami, is it, a, is it a fifth taste or is it an enhancer for the other four tastes? Yes. Um, so in, it wasn't just the first four tastes that we all know so well were just, was discovered in like 2,000 years ago, Aristotle's time, but this umami wasn't identified as, an, as a thing, as even a, you know, had a name until uh, 1906. And then it wasn't identified as a taste until 2002 when uh, researchers in Miami actually said we have taste receptors for umami. So it is a taste. It's just came along so much further after that little people know about it, or a few people know about it. So it is a taste, and yeah. it's also an enhancer. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it does. It brings out more of the savoriness, so salty and sour are enhanced. You don't want to put it with sweetness, which is why you don't have savory desserts. <laughs> All taste buds are enhancers to each other. Um, so imagine taking a going to the grocery store and you're going through the produce section and there's a you know all the bins with all this stuff, and then there's the loose arugula there, you know, right there. You can't grab a handful of that and stick it in your mouth and start chewing on it because the bitterness is just going to overwhelm you so quickly. Okay. But the moment you take some of that arugula, squeeze some lemon on it, uh, and then you, you do the same, you're like, okay, though, so this is sort of peppery, but it's sour at the same time, and your brain is just going back and forth, okay? But if you take that lemon again, and then you cut it in half and squeeze it in your mouth, it's too overwhelming, okay? So these five different taste buds are complementary to each other. By themselves, they will overwhelm your brain very quickly. They will bore your brain very quickly, okay? So, but when you pair two or three of them together, uh, they enhance each other. They bounce off each other really well. So, they're all enhancers to each other all at the same time. Kind of like kettle cork. <laughs> you have wanted to add something to that? Yeah, I'll just add two things. I'm learning so much. This is great. Uh, about adding flavor and boosting flavor. The first thing is we all have our cookbooks and we all made these recipes the way we like them. We're all different. If you try my beefless stew and you say, oh, that's kind of too much rosemary for me. Okay, then leave the rosemary out, cut it in half. If you're a hot and spicy lover and something of mine isn't hot and spicy, go ahead and add it. So I say make it once, adjust from there the way you like it. The second thing is, you're, I use a lot of dried herbs and spices instead of SOS. So there's, and I, again, I have a section in my book <coughs> just for that as well, but uh, of most importance is use dried herbs and spices that aren't from the past decade. Use, you know, fresher <laughs> dried herbs and spices, which sounds like it doesn't make sense. Like if they're dried, they should be good forever. Not so. So when the shelf you, life is about six months. Six yeah, months, wow. yeah. So when you get home, Google, or now, Google your town and spice shop and see if you have a spice shop near you and then take a field trip. We have two in town and Savory Spice is one of them. And it's so much fun going to a spice shop. And they give you 10% off if you show your True North name tag. Yeah. And you'll just get more flavor. You'll have more variety in the spice shop. I still buy from you know grocery stores if I'm there and I need something. I don't want to go to the spice shop, but just keep that in mind. It would be a great treat to yourself to go to your spice shop uh, here or when you get home and buy like ten new jars or bags of your favorite spices and herbs. You will love it. It'll be a nice treat for yourself. They've got a cinnamon and savory that you swear has sugar in it, and oh, yeah? it doesn't. It's like the best cinnamon I've ever tasted. Melinda? Yes. Melinda. I have kind of like two questions. I know we're running out of time, but is there a method of stacking flavors? Yes. And what is, is there any simplistic way of... Very simplistic. Um, carrot ginger soup, for example, which I make, uh, which 
during this extravaganza we did not make for you guys, but um, just take care of ginger soup. Uh, I start out by dry sauteing some carrots in a pot with some onions, garlic, you know, celery kind of thing. So then we do the evaporation, right? So the, the water goes out and then the carrot flavor in the carrots stay behind, along with the onions and garlic. Once the bottom of the pot and those carrots and onions are starting to brown up and you see that caramelization going, okay? Then we will add some, um, I add carrot juice to, that, to the vegetables, okay? Then, we cook, then I cook that carrot juice until it's dry. So it's this sort of carrot, applesauce sort of consistency kind of the thing okay then once all that's ready then the broth goes into that okay the broth also containing some carrot part along with the celery and all the other stuff that may may have been in there so it's sort of this carrot on top of carrot on top of carrot and that's and that's how you like that's how you would stack flavor and enhance a more well-rounded uh, carrot flavor. Uh, I also mentioned the thing about the, uh, the cheese pizza uh, thing, right? right? So when we do my, my soups and stews, we'll use fresh onions, okay? And then we'll do dehydrated onions in some form, you know, whether it's granulated or the, the onion flakes. And then there's also onion in the broth, okay? So it's like onion on top of onion on top of onion on top of carrot on top of carrot on top of carrot. Okay. Yeah. When, you, when you talk about onion, one of the things I forgot to say is, to me, everything starts with an onion if it's SOS free cooking. Every now and then I'll get a person that cannot eat onion for real. That's the hardest and for me. Garlic, I can take out. It, I mean, it's not as good, but you can. But I find that if you cannot eat onion, if you are strictly SOS free, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, the, the people that I'm talking to are like actually allergic and they can't eat any of them and I, I feel bad because I, I can't make it taste good without an onion personally. Mm -hmm. It's hard. That, that is the hardest, you know. But it, I would say take the same approach as you do with all the others. You're taking out the salt. It's so hard to take out the salt initially, but then you make the flavor so much better with all the other things, you know, especially cooked onion, you know, savoriness there. So how can you get more savoriness without onion? You know, think about that. Just similar approach. There's a spice called hing that the Kara Krishnas use because they can't have onion and garlic. Some people use that, but there's nothing like mm -hmm. an onion, you know. Mm -hmm. well, do you, let me add to them. You want the next question? I guess I'm ready for the Okay, next this question. is a quick one, guys. What is your favorite SOS free meal? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, what is my favorite meal? <laughs> 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 So tough. I, I knew that was coming, so I was sitting here wondering what would I ask for on my birthday or something. <laughs> Probably potato salad. <laughs> something with a little fat in it. Anything with avocado, any kind of Asian dish. Um, I love breakfast, so maybe I'm a grainaholic, I don't know, but I love breakfast. I don't really have a favorite meal. I love salads. I have a curried sweet you're potato being, salad. You're being executed for a crime. You, you didn't oh. commit. What did I ask that for? Now you got to make a decision. Okay, that helps. Okay. Probably like a, a Japanese meal, like sushi, vegan sushi rolls, and mm -hmm. salad, and the soup with the with the flavors with the ginger and the garlic. That's only a three course meal. And then I have to pick a dessert. I don't know. But yeah, thank you. So mine, it hasn't changed in seven years. The the yams that we had, not the orange ones, but the white ones, a roasted hand of yam and steamed broccoli. I could eat it every day. I practically do. I never get tired of it. And then the second answer would be anything in the air fryer. Anything that doesn't mm -hmm. taste good regular, I swear <laughs> to God. You know how like at restaurants they throw cheese and bacon on stuff when it doesn't taste good or they want to get rid of it, you know, because it's day old? You could have something that's just like meh and put it in the air fryer, and I don't know what magically happens, but wow, you know, and, you know, sweet potato fries, regular fries, Japanese sweet potatoes, air fry, a little habanero vinegar, and I'm There's no water, happy. so it's the concentration. Yeah, it's the concentration, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably oh, yeah, it. Yeah. So, but, but Hannah Yams, man, mm -hmm. are my favorites. Japanese is a close second. And texture, too. Uh, for me, it's whatever I haven't had in a while. Uh, oh, sex? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I said I was going to be... Well, that somebody 
No, I'm okay. Watch. I'm, not, I'm on probation. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, but my, my tongue goes faster than my brain. Anyway. I kept looking at Kathy saying certain things, and I was like, you're going to let that go? Huh? You're going to let that go? Like what? Oh, because she's being good? Yeah. So yeah. Now, yeah. now it makes sense. She's being nice. <laughs> right. well, this, is, this is professionally, being professionally oh, filmed. So. The world. so, yeah, for me, it's something I haven't had in a while. Uh, you can't eat, you know, the most delicious favorite kind of dish you love. If you have that two, three days in a row, you're gonna get tired of it. You're gonna want something else. So, yeah, variety. For me, it's variety. I don't have a, I'm not wired to have a Hannah sweet potato and broccoli every day. Cause after the third time, that would drive me crazy. So, but everybody's different. I'm Goldhammer, you're Lyle. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, I have two. One is, first, tempeh is amazing. I could do anything with tempeh I'm loving. Um, but tempeh with greens, Chef AJ got me hooked on the cruciferous crunch from Trader Joe's, but Costco also has a sweet kale mix. Um, it comes with poppy seed dressing, just throw that away. But the kale mix with uh, balsamic, aged balsamic, or any of the vinegars out there, a little mustard and um, nutritional yeast and tempeh or beans, but the tempeh is amazing. That's my breakfast most days. <laughs> and the other one would be sweet potato tacos. I just love sweet potato tacos, um, any type of bean or tempeh, uh, avocado, fresh tomatoes. And I usually just do serve them in uh, cabbage cups because I don't want to do the tortilla, um, although that's good too. Uh, but yeah, I could have that every day. I'd be happy. So the last question for the panel, we'll start with Katie May. Any other secrets, tips, tricks, or advice for helping people implement, maintain, and enjoy an SOS-free diet? Um, so many, um, but I, so many things. Um, but along with the flavor, just one thing I thought about is the shape of your food actually affects the flavor of it. Um, because the flavor is not just taste, the five tastes we talked about, but flavor is actually your whole experience of the food. So the aroma, the texture in your mouth, um, all of it, and the text and the presentation. And the texture and presentation are really affected by the shape of it. So, uh, like imagine beets. I would never eat chopped beets up the way they have them steamed here. I love them, but you wouldn't eat those beets chopped like that if they were raw but you could add raw shredded beets to a salad and it'd be delicious, right? So uh, in a way that's kind of obvious, but some people don't think about that. Like they don't like zucchini, they're never gonna have like the chopped zucchini we have here. Um, one of the things you get on, put on if you're eating really you know, simple initially or for whatever reason. But if you, like that for me, that would never do it. But if I were to slice zucchini really thin and then grill it or roast it, amazing or if you spiralize the zucchini and then make pasta out of it. So just something to think about as you're trying to add in more variety and satisfy yourselves. Um, any other tips? Um, don't be so hard on yourself. I mean, don't, uh, I, I don't have the experience of having a addictive sort of personality, you know, I don't know about I don't know what it's like to be a food addict and to have that sort of stress and dilemma every time you sit down at a, at a meal. Uh, so coming from my own perspective is just when you decide that you want to improve your diet and eat healthier, just take it one meal at a time. And if every now and then, every you know, whenever a meal that isn't so healthy happens, enjoy it. And then know that the very next meal, you it's a blank slate again. Okay, so don't you know that's my advice. Don't be so hard on yourself. Enjoy the experience of eating healthy meals, uh, one at a time. Figure out what works for you, what doesn't, which one you like, which one you don't. Uh, and if there are some you know <laughs> some some things you shouldn't have sprinkled in there. Live okay. life experience. Yeah. Okay, I'll go next. Two things. One is just kind of a fun thing. Whenever you don't get in a rut, 
Whenever you go to the grocery store or every other time, buy something you've never bought before or a different variety of something that you usually buy. It's really fun because it's easy to get in a rut sometimes. And the other is, a lot of you guys probably already know this, but don't get, don't feel like you have to do recipes all of the time. Get in the habit of just learning how to put food together. That's what I do at home. I very rarely make recipes. They have their place, definitely. But I just throw food together and it's very repetitious sometimes. Uh, I love the potato, I call the big pile of food. So you, I have the potato or the starch on the bottom, I have the veggies on top, and then on top of that, like the cherry on top, I have the dressing or the some grated pistachios or uh, my extra flavor, avocado or some fresh herbs or something. So, And you can do so many things with those three layers and just throw them together. You don't need a recipe. So that's what I do, and I get excited before every single meal. I just like, woo, I get to eat again. So, and it's just a potato. And sometimes I won't add any herbs and spices at all. It's just potatoes, the collard greens, and some avocado, and I'm in heaven. Yeah. So, yeah. Perfect. All right. So in closing, what I'd like to say is that there's always hope. Wherever you are in your journey, either for weight loss or health or SOS-free eating, there's hope that your taste can change. You know, as I mentioned before, we develop taste preferences for what we habitually eat, and it can take at least 15 tries of a new food for it to become a food that you like and eventually prefer. And those of you that have fasted know that I've, I've talked to some of you, and after a fast, you eat steamed zucchini and you literally have a food gasm. And it's like the most delicious, and you say, oh my God, this is like vanilla ice cream. So, so taste can change. You actually can teach your body to crave healthy food because what you eat today, you'll crave tomorrow. So my advice to you is to do what Dr. Lyle says in every interview I've done with him, which is where you seek excellence, but not perfection. And whatever you decide, at least don't have the stuff in your house. If you wanna go out and have some SOS or whatever, that's fine. But if you really wanna neuroadapt, it takes time. Sometimes one trip, it's not like you go to, well, except for John McMahon who goes to True North, well, he actually went twice. But most people, it's not one and done. Most people, it's a process, like quitting smoking. Sometimes it takes 10 or 12 times, but don't give up. Just keep adding healthy food, subtracting the less healthy food, and then one day we'll all be Dr. Goldhammer. Thank you. <laughs>